Welcome to Simpler Bible, a daily journey to biblical understanding. On episode 29, we are going to cover Exodus 11 and 12, super significant passage in the story of Exodus, but also in the story of redemption. So one of the things that we've talked about in these first four weeks is how many things point to the redemptive work of God through Jesus Christ. We've already seen that a couple of times here in the Exodus story, looking back that God was going to redeem these people from slavery and set them free. And that's what God has done for us. He set us free from slavery to sin, set people free from slavery to the law as a means for righteousness, uh, works-based righteousness, and now we are free in Christ. I cannot wait to get into more of those things with you, but today we've got a lot to cover as we look at the Passover. So let's dive in here to chapter 11 of Exodus, beginning in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Yet one more plague, and I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt, and afterwards he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people, that they may ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Now, this has already been referenced for us. It was referenced for us back in Genesis 15, 14. We saw that God had already promised that he was going to have the people of God for about 400 years be in somebody else's land. But when he brought them out, he would allow them to plunder those people. And so this is the plundering of those people. And so it says this, Moreover, the man Moses was great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh, the servants, and in the sight of the people. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt will die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. So a couple of things. One, we saw the prophecy that God was going to allow the Israelites to plunder the people in whose land they were dwelling. We saw in Exodus 3, 21 and 22, God has already told Moses that, he, that the people are supposed to ask for all the wealth of Egypt before they leave. And we've already seen in Exodus 4, 22 through 23, that God had promised that what he was going to do is he was going to say, Pharaoh, let my firstborn go. If you don't let my firstborn go, I will destroy your firstborn. And so this is a callback. Sometimes I think we don't connect chapter 11 to chapter 4. And sometimes we don't connect chapter 11 to chapter 3 or back in Genesis 15. Look, let's be honest. It's a lot. It is a lot of information. And so it's really easy to get overwhelmed by it and not tie all these pieces together all the time. So why are the Israelites asking for wealth from the Egyptians? Well, in part because God promised Abraham this back in chapter 15 of Genesis. In part because God told Moses to do this in Genesis chapter 3. Why are we seeing the death of the firstborn of the Egyptians about to take place? Because God had already told Moses in Exodus 4, they're not going to listen to you. He's going to harden his heart. Then I'll harden his heart. And as a result, since he won't let my firstborn go, I'll strike down his firstborn. So pick this up again in verse 6. There shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as never been or ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. We've seen that pattern repeated several times already. And I love this, not a dog shall growl. So going back to what we talked about a couple of days ago, when he said not a single animal died, not a single fly was found. Uh, these kind of, it, it's, it's this... It, way of kind of proving this point, right? So like the dogs in Egypt, sorry, the dogs in, in the land of Goshen where the Israelites live, not even the dogs are unsettled on this day. They're not growling and none of the people are making any noise. God's not going to strike down any of the people of, of Goshen, of the Israelites. So he says, the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these, your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me saying, get out, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And Moses left from Pharaoh in hot anger. And the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people go out of the land. Let's roll on into chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the beginning in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb into their father's house or according to their father's house as a lamb for each household. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he shall take his nearest neighbor. And according to the number of persons, according to what you can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. So the Israelites have been living in Egypt at this point for 430 years. We're about to see that in just a moment. I've mentioned that in a couple of uh, videos and for, for sure in some of the blog posts. And so we're about to see that timeline. But uh, 
Moses is now instructed by God to tell the people, this is now the beginning of your month. This is day one of your calendar year. On the 10th day of this month, I want you to take a lamb into your house according to the size of each family. So have enough lamb for everybody, right? And then on the 14th day of this month, you're going to kill it. So I haven't gotten to that part yet. Sorry, spoilers. Look at verse five. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their, kill their lambs at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lentils of the house in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roast it on the fire without with unleavened bread, sorry, with unleavened bread, bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled, but roast it, its head, its legs, its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until morning. Anything that remains until morning, you shall burn. In this manner, you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I don't know if you were told this. I was always taught that it was... Uh, it was like the angel of death that passed through. But twice now in this text, we've already seen that it was God who was going to pass through. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of the Egyptians, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So there's that phrase again. This time it's coming because of judgment. Verse 13, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, this is very, very important. All right. And I want us to consider these things that the, the Passover here is really a picture of Christ. We know that. We know that from the New Testament for a couple of reasons. One, we see in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, that the Bible tells us that Christ, our Passover lamb, has already been sacrificed. You might be wondering about the unleavened bread. That's Unleavened bread is just bread without yeast in it. It's, it's flat, right? It doesn't have a chance to rise. We're going to find out later that the reason that their bread didn't have any yeast in it is because the Egyptians hurried them out of the land so quickly they didn't have time to put yeast in it, which begs the question, I suppose, if they were told not to eat bread with leaven in it, why is it that they were still preparing to put leaven in it? And the only reason they didn't is because they were rushed out of the city. But that's another question for another time. So think about this for a moment. Jesus is our Passover lamb. Paul says so, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. What does it mean for Christ to be our Passover lamb? Now, in this case, the Egyptians, the people who did not have the blood on the covering of the door, those people were going to be destroyed. And then God was going to come in with his judgment and he would see the people who had the covering of the blood. He would see the people who had the blood over their door frames. And when he saw that blood, he would pass over them for judgment. It is important to note that Christ, our Passover lamb, because we have come under the covering of his blood, we know that there is a coming judgment of God one day. We know that he is going to, to bring wrath and judgment with him against, against all the people who denied him, all the people who refused him, all the people who hardened their hearts against him. We see this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The, the people believed a lie, believed what was false, did not put their faith in Christ, and God handed them over to the, those delusions, and ultimately they were destroyed. The people who do not put faith in God through Jesus Christ will be destroyed. But everyone who is under the covering of the blood of Jesus will be saved. Now, another thing that's really interesting is Matthew 26. It's the last night of the life of Christ. And what is he celebrating with his disciples? We might want to say the Lord's Supper, but he's not. Not yet. He is celebrating with his apostles that night the Passover. They are celebrating the Passover feast together in Matthew 26. At the end of each of the Gospels, they are celebrating Passover. And Jesus then, after the Passover celebration, takes the bread and says, Now this is my body broken for you. Takes the cup, says, Now this is my blood shed for you. What Jesus does in that last night of his life is he claims ownership of the Passover supper. People had been celebrating for a thousand, a thousand years or more, 1,500 years. They had been celebrating that God had set them free from slavery in Egypt. Every year on the 15th day of the first month, they would celebrate the Passover. Look, God set us free. God set us free from, from our Egyptian captivity. God set us free from slavery. And then what Jesus does is he hijacks it. And he says, no, 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 I'm the real lamb. My blood's the real blood. And in me, you really have life. And so Jesus claims the Passover as uh, being about him. And he is now the lamb. He is the Passover lamb. His blood was shed. We are under the covering of his blood. Now, one other thing, this unleavened bread, bread without yeast in it. What does that mean? What's the spiritual implication for that? Well, 
It's in the same verse that I've already given you, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Paul says, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be an unleavened loaf, as indeed you already are. So we who have put faith in Christ are unleavened loaves. What does that mean? It, it means that all the things of the world, in fact, in the Gospels, the yeast, the leaven, is the false teaching of the Pharisees. It, it is what is false. It is those things that are untrue. And so when the text says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, get rid of all the, un, all the leaven, get rid of all the yeast so that you can be unleavened as indeed you already are, what he's saying is remove from you everything that is false, everything that is not consistent with Christ, everything that is in accordance with a false teaching. And so this unleavened bread and the lamb are both pictures of now who we are in Christ. We are unleavened. We are free from anything that is false. We have been under the covering of the blood. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. His blood shed for our freedom, shed so that we can be set free from slavery. And we're going to come back to the Passover again uh, in a couple of weeks, and I'm excited about that. So, he says here in verse 21 of chapter 12, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, touch the lentils, the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning. For the Lord, there it is again, will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lentils and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer. So maybe that's it. Maybe... Maybe there's the Lord and the destroyer, right? To enter your house, to strike you, you shall observe this right as a statute for you and your sons forever. So we see that Jesus and his disciples are still celebrating this 1,500 years later. Verse 25, when you come to the land that the Lord your God will give you as he promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say, what do you mean by this sacrifice? You shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but he spared our houses. And the people heard this and they bowed their heads and they worshiped. And then the people of Israel went and they did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, they did. And at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the livestock. Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all of his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a single house where someone was not dead. I have often thought about this moment, this great cry in the land of Egypt. So you've got at this point 602,000 Israelite men, not counting women and children. You've got over a million people of Israel. You've got this Egyptian nation, probably, I don't know, maybe the size of San Antonio, right? Two, three million people. And someone in every house in Egypt, not in the land of Goshen because they obey the Lord, but someone in every house in the land of Egypt has died. And there raises a cry that night that has never been heard of before. And I just, I wonder what it would be like if you and I were nestled in the middle of, of San Antonio, downtown San Antonio somewhere, and we hear the entire city of San Antonio cry out with a wail of the loss of their firstborn and just how terrifying that must have been. So look at verse 31 of chapter 12. Then he, Pharaoh, summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up, go from my people, both you and the people of Israel. Go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks, your herds, as you have said. Be gone and bless me also. He's still looking for a little blessing there. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We will all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. And the people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver, for gold, for jewelry, for clothing. And the Lord had given people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have whatever they asked. And thus they plundered the Egyptians. That takes you back to Genesis 15. The people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, not counting the women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them. This, don't skip over verse 38, a mixed multitude also went up with them. Remember back in Genesis 12 when God made the promise to Abraham that through him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Here we have a mixed multitude. The Hebrews went into the land of Egypt and now the Hebrews are coming out with a mixed multitude. We already see Gentiles. We already see other people groups being included with the blessing of God. People who put, remember what it said on the plague of hail, how all the servants of Pharaoh who believed that the hail was going to rain down were bringing their servants and their livestock inside. 
it's no wonder here. Now, why would this mixed multitude be going up with them? They must have believed the things of God. So here are these people who are believing what God is saying and they're going up with the Hebrews. So here is a Gentile inclusion in verse 38. Don't skip over it. Super, super important. And then look at verse 40. The time that the people lived in Israel, sorry, the time the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of those years, on the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And so this is a dramatic scene. This is an overwhelming scene. But now the people have been set free. Uh, the blood of the lamb has spared them. And those who did not have the blood of the lamb were put to death. And God has allowed them to plunder the Egyptians and to come out with great possessions. And along with the Israelites, a mixed multitude going up to receive the blessing of God. And it is such a cool thing. And I hope that it just resonates with you how big and beautiful this is and how you and I have come under the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are unleavened. We have been cleaned of anything that is false. And we now belong to the Lord. And we are now under the blessing of God. And so hope that today was a blessing to you. And I will see you tomorrow. Thank you so much for journeying with us today at Simpler Bible through another section of scripture where we come to know and understand God a little bit better. Look, if you're brand new to Simpler Bible, we have all sorts of resources available for you. Go to our website, simplerbible.com, and there you can find these videos, you can find our podcast, you can find links to our social media, and you can even find a blog post with additional scriptures if you want to go into a little bit more study than we had time to cover in this podcast and video today. We hope that this tool will be exactly that for you, a tool. Not something that replaces your daily walk with God, but something that enhances your daily walk with God and helps you to know and enjoy Him more. Thank you so much for being part of this, and we'll see you again tomorrow.